when I'm confronted with uh, such a small audience because I'm growing uh, incredibly dissatisfied with uh, big uh, conferences, big audiences, for, because I think that I, I don't think my work necessarily interests everybody. Uh, and I'm not interested to uh, discuss uh, my work with, with everybody. And in, in that sense, I'm really happy because the audience is small and uh, the person who I will discuss with is Van Olof Wallenstein, who is uh, a person whose work I, I know quite well uh, now. Um, and it had also a certain influence on what I'm doing right now, which is not really uh, this book. I think uh, uh, not only actually his work on, uh, on uh, architecture and biopolitics, which is for me was first encounter with, with, with your work at large, uh, which also I have to say it saved me from a kind of a Gamben kind of drift towards uh, <laughs> ontological fundamentalism, which I think uh, uh, it, it, this work has uh, being extremely influenced by it. Uh, so I think that would be a point of discussion with you, for sure. So in that sense, I'm really happy because these are really, for me, the fruitful moments where, uh, you know, aside of all these broadcasting uh, uh, apparatuses, uh, we can really have a productive uh, discussion, uh, which might help me for the work I'm doing right now. So uh, the book... Uh, so I, I... Forgive me if I will be very informal in talking about the book, but... I don't feel anymore to defend this book. I would like, on the contrary, to be very relaxed and also show the limits of, of, this, of this book and what I think uh, makes this book uh, not limited, but also uh, referring to a very particular moment in my work uh, and uh, also of, of, of the historical moment, if you want, in which I wrote this book, which was very, for me very, very important. I consider this book the, the romantic period of my uh, work <laughs> and maybe the most polemical. Um, and in a way, the title itself was uh, already... I mean, I wrote first the title and then the book. And at the beginning, the title for me was a uh, battle cry against uh, uh, the environment in which I was uh, working. Uh, which was, uh, of course, on a small scale, the Berlage Institute, on a large scale, the post colasian uh, delirious uh, Holland, uh, and an, on a much larger scale, the kind of um, denial of the importance of architecture, which uh, has been uh, very strong, actually, when I, I was writing this book. So the, the strange paradox was that architecture was becoming commercially very, very important. I mean, and in a way, the rise of uh, uh, architectural stardom was one of the symptoms of that. But on a theoretical level, there was a sort of, uh, uh, at least what I experienced at that moment, uh, a sort of um, denial, I mean, disinterest in architecture. And, you know, it was, everything was about research. Uh, everything was about uh, mapping the most... Uh, out, uh, updated uh, kind of urbanization, going to Dubai or going to all these kind of uh, cities. Um, and where, in fact, the, 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 the jingle was always the same. You know, architecture can no longer, you know, control these phenomena. And, and in a way, uh, writing this book was, for me, was uh, a sort of way to kind of free myself from this uh, condition, to really... Uh, re-engage in a kind of the most fundamental way possible with, with what is architecture and, and, and what actually characterized the, uh, the it's, it's, its most, if you want, um, conceptual, categorical dimension. And of course, the moment I start this work, I realized that, I mean, it was uh, uh, really uh, difficult. Not only difficult, but impossible. Um, so, uh, in the book, I try really uh, to be very, uh, maybe it's very banal to say, subjective. So the thesis, uh, of course, uh, is an attempt to um, re-identify the uh, role of architecture within the transformations of the, of the city. In fact, one of the theses of the book is that, in a way, architecture makes sense 
even if it's a singular finite object, makes sense only if uh, within uh, the, the dimension, the political, social, cultural dimension of the city. Um, and the second, uh, let's say, uh, thesis was that that sort of relationship paradoxically takes the form of a very strong uh, instance of separation, of marking the edge, of, of making a border. You know? In fact, the, the word absolute is exactly referring to that kind of, uh, if you want, uh, condition. And of course, uh, a critical background of this uh, idea of architecture is the rise of urbanization. And that was for me the big uh, discovery uh, while writing this book. Of course, today, uh, architects use the word urbanization and city almost uh, interchangeably. Uh, but in fact, the, the rise of urbanization uh, is a very particular uh, and fundamental, at the same time, phenomena, which has changed uh, the city in a very radical way. And, um, and of course, it's not only on the level of form, uh, in the sense of physical form, but on the level of ethos and the level of uh, really, subjectivity uh, of, of, of the city. Um, and in a way, this uh, critical role of architecture, of being a finite uh, separated object, becomes even more critical and not obvious. So here you see, actually, this is one of my favorite uh, drawings. as a plan of one of the earliest uh, cities uh, in, in history. And uh, you can see, actually, in the most... Uh, uh, kind of uh, radical way, uh, this idea of, of, of architecture and, and the city as, as marking actually an edge uh, and defining actually the, the city itself from, from, from the edge. And of course, um, it's exactly this sort of uh, condition which in antiquity is very strong. Think of the uh, Greek uh, polis or the concept of the uh, temenos. I don't know if you know what is a temenos. It's a, Temenos is one of the most archetypical forms of uh, Greek uh, sanctuaries where, in fact, there is a kind of uh, uh, border that separates everything uh, that happens outside from actually what is the inside. And for me, that's really one of the most intense archetypes of, of, of architecture. Um, and in a way, this is a sort of Temenos. Uh, sort of condition. And in a way, it's exactly this condition that uh, with the rise of modern city and urbanization uh, completely collapse. So the city becomes this kind of uh, potentially infinite uh, system where in fact there is no uh, border between inside and outside. Uh, where in fact um, the issue of management and population uh, becomes a fundamental uh, uh, let's say, order at stake to be governed, to be organized. And of course, uh, this actually has uh, rise uh, at the end of the Middle Age. Uh, in the Renaissance, actually, it's very interesting. Um, one of the reasons why, and this is something I didn't mention in the book, but I'm, something I'm working right now, the, the rediscovery of Vitruvius, uh, which is, uh, for many art history, architectural historians, is always idealized as a kind of rediscovery of the Vitruvius of the classical orders. But actually, Vitruvius was a soldier uh, in pension, uh, um, and two-thirds of the, the architecture is about management. It's about how to uh, make cities uh, from a very man managerial point of view, how to make uh, roads, how to maintain them, uh, and even how to uh, move people uh, through cities. So actually, uh, the, classic, the, the five orders is not only a, a small section of the book, but perhaps the most nostalgic or the most, if you want, uh, uh, you know, the kind of more, more um, and, and of course, the most well-known part of Vitruvius. But most of, also, also the Vitruvius read by Renaissance architects like Francesco Di Giorgio, Bramante, was really the Vitruvius about urban organization. Uh, about uh, the construction of machines. I mean, the conclusion of the architecture is all about war machines and how to construct them. I mean, and there are passages which are amazing where Vitruvius almost anticipate the parametric design, you know, how parameters, in a way, constantly change architectural form. And architectural form is not about representation, but really about performance. Now, um, this is actually, it's embedded in the evolution of the city from the 16th century. 
but of course, uh, and of course, the, the, the rise of colonial cities makes clear this kind of urgency of management. It's interesting that this actually image of Caracas, a uh, uh, city that, uh, colonial uh, city of, um, of uh, founded in the end of 16th century. And it's interesting that the law of the Indy uh, was actually entirely based on Vitruvius and Alberti. So you see actually how, uh, in a way, already from the Renaissance, this kind of issue of organization and management, uh, you know, against actually architecture as a representation becomes important. Uh, but of course, the, the person that, uh, there are the, the, the theorist that really, for the first time, write down a theory of urbanization is uh, Ildefonso Cerda, who actually, for the first time, invents the neologism uh, urbanization. Uh, he writes uh, this uh, incredible uh, Treaty, uh, uh, the theory, uh, general theory of urbanization, uh, published in 1867, which is very interesting because it's exactly the same year Marx published uh, Das Kapital. And in fact, for me, uh, the two books or the two uh, has uh, interesting uh, connections. And, and, and it's not a coincidence that they appear almost at the same time. Of course, they didn't know each other at all. But what is interesting is that with the project of the expansion of the city of Barcelona, Cerda is really able to apply his theory, which is, uh, which is actually the idea of urbanization, where in fact uh, this, the term city is uh, completely uh, erased. Uh, in a way, uh, Cerda introduced the idea of uh, the term uh, urbanization to replace uh, the uh, term ciudad, which for him is a new category where in fact uh, city is no longer uh, an issue of representation, of political representation, but is really uh, an issue of economic, uh, today we would say, biopolitical uh, management. And it's really amazing to, uh, the extent to which Serda link uh, the form of the city to issues like property, uh, uh, life, um, let's say, uh, uh, management, uh, uh, statistics, uh, Serda is the first uh, urban planner to use uh, statistics as a, as a sort of uh, material uh, to construct uh, his plan, which means that the form of the city is really an, an embodiment of the most uh, biopolitical properties of uh, human, uh, human life. And of course, uh, <clears throat> within this, uh, let's say, new understanding of the city, architecture definitely uh, lose uh, its, uh, let's say, dimension of, of marking, uh, of, of defining uh, the city in terms of its form. Um, of course, in the, in the first chapter, I, I look to not only uh, Serda, but to other projects that in a way uh, develop further this kind of idea of urbanization as a kind of dissolution uh, of the city. Uh, of course, the work of uh, Ludwig Hilbersheimer, which is for me uh, is very important, and I just uh, publish. Um, recently a very long uh, essay on his work. Unfortunately, uh, when everybody looked to these drawings, uh, I think the drawings are a problem in his work because he wrote a lot and um, people actually look to his drawings but don't read his writings. Where actually uh, Hilbersheim really took further uh, the project of Serda and showed to what extent actually the city was, in fact, as he said, uh, a relationship of two things, the individual cell uh, the interior, let's say, of the house and the general infrastructural system. So in a way, in, in, the, in Hilbersheimer theory, architecture itself as an object, as a singularity, as a single finite uh, form, completely disappear, uh, let's say, in the urban condition. And this is very visible uh, in his um, drawings, uh, uh, especially in his American period, uh, where, in fact, you see that in all these projects, uh, you see only the landscape and the infrastructure, and in a way, architecture is gone. Um, in the book, actually, I made a sort of uh, parallel and claimed how, in a way, the graphic uh, minimal... By the way, I, I'm, I love Hilbersheimer drawings. I think they're fantastic. And of course, I, didn't, I don't say that in the book, but uh, in my, in the, the, all the examples I, I bring in the book are things I like uh, and I enjoy immensely. So that's also, I think, something to be openly said. <laughs> Otherwise, I mean, <laughs> I would never be able to uh, argue uh, to you know the relevance of this. Um, but actually, of course, they're also terrifying in, a, in an interesting way. 
And in the book, I argue how the graphic uh, minimalism of Hilbertheimer drawings are, in a way, uh, embodied in, in the minimalism of, of Mies architecture. And in fact, uh, it's very interesting because uh, one of the most interesting readings of uh, Mies is the one that uh, Sven has put forward in his book, The Silence of Mies. Uh, and, uh, um, in a similar way uh, of uh, Brandon Joseph, uh, um, Zvenolov actually argued this link between John Cage and, uh, and, and the silence of Mir, which is not a, let's say, a silence that uh, erase um, everything. So it's not a, a sort of essentialist uh, silence, but it's a silence that allow other, the cacophony of the city, in a way, to inhabit uh, architecture. And it's very interesting because these ideas were well formulated by Hilbert Simer already in the 1920s. Um, and in a way also, uh, Hilbert Simer uh, minimalism has to be understood uh, as a, a kind of urbanization that is reduced to its, uh, let's say, most basic properties, precisely because what is at stake is f goes far beyond uh, the possibility of, of architecture to represent this uh, condition, uh, a, 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 an idea that is uh, extremely uh, is further radicalized by the work of Archizum with the project No Stop City, where in fact, as you can see in this uh, famous sketch, which is the first drawing of the project, the city is replaced by uh, what um, Archizum call uh, a cloud, uh, basically the whole the information and knowledge uh, that uh, in the urban conditions becomes much more important than what Marx would have defined the fixed capital of the city. And in a way here, in, in one of the theses of uh, Archizum was really to develop a city without architecture, uh, where in fact uh, a city was simply a, uh, as, as they would say, a toilet every, uh, f uh, let's say, 100 square meters. Uh, and so the pure kind of biological uh, bi biopolitical form of, uh, forms of reproduction becomes actually come to the fore as what really defined the urban condition. And in fact, today, Branzi said, well, the city is uh, uh, a, a, a toilet uh, every, uh, uh, let's say, 500, uh, 100 meters uh, and a laptop every uh, five square meters. Uh, so in a way, uh, this for me is really like the... Uh, the moment in which the thesis I put forward becomes extremely problematic. And, and, and this for me was very important. Um, and of course, uh, of course, Colas is perhaps the theories that try to deal uh, in the last 40 years has been the first, maybe the theories that have tried to reinvent architecture within this condition. I mean, this is uh, his uh, first project, the city of Captive Globe. Um, but uh, I try, uh, in the book, I try to step back uh, or to, in a way, not take that kind of uh, direction. Uh, not, um, I mean, in a way, to, uh, to go back to a possibility of, in a way, embedding this, uh, this condition uh, and at the same time trying to re redefine the possibility for architecture of, of, of defining this uh, idea of, um, of uh, architecture of spaces made of finite parts, which allow actually the subject to again be aware that uh, no matter how urbanization has dissolved the city, in a way the, the city remains as, as a composition of parts. Uh, and the best example I could find, and also the, for me the, the, the architect I still endorse as perhaps the only one that has succeeded in this kind of dialectic is uh, Mies, of course, especially the late Mies the most anti-political and most corporate means, where in fact this uh, condition of finiteness, uh, which is very much represented by a form that recur in all projects by Mies, which is basically the plinth. Uh, all projects by Mies have always this, the, which is of course a co sort of temenos, if you want, a temenos uh, strategy, which Mies used always in all his projects for the first one to the last one. He always used this kind of, uh, uh, architectural form. Uh, and at the same time, of course, on top of that, um, he slides these kind of very generic uh, volumes, which of course had no whatsoever uh, pretension to represent anything but to be exactly those kind of uh, silent in the sense that uh, Zvenolov has described them, uh, um, forms that allow actually the, the city uh, to 
the urbanization actually, the mo even its most, uh, uh, at that time, uh, cruel uh, emblems, like the, the famous, uh, the fact that he, uh, you know, uh, BS always used steel, no? Unlike Le Corbusier, we always use concrete. Concrete something you, it's a, it's a material you can mold in whatever kind of shape. Well, actually, steel is much more crude because you have to accept uh, those pieces as a ready-made. And as you know, uh, one of the uh, uh, classical motif of uh, Mies architecture are these uh, height beams uh, hanged on the facade, which really express that crudeness of the ready-made industrial objects, uh, which at that time was the emblem of the most uh, extreme reification of architecture through, actually, industrialization. And I like, I mean, I, this contrast uh, between the temenos condition and at the same time the uh, embracement of, 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 of the ethos of urbanization for me represents still uh, a challenge, uh, at least for, for me, and, and a possibility, let's say, <laughs> Of, of an absolute um, architecture. So, uh, in the book, I, I just go uh, through uh, a few examples, the work of uh, Palladio, in relationship with the rise of the urban uh, territory uh, uh, in uh, Veneto in the 16th century. Um, and so, I try to read Palladio's work as a work made of very finite uh, objects, and I think La Rodonda is one of the best examples but uh, in relationship with the uh, expansion and, and urban, in fact, uh, uh, let's say, growth of the region uh, beside uh, Venice, when Venice actually un undergo this uh, terrible crisis in the 16th century, where uh, the city has to shift from maritime economy to agriculture. So in a way, uh, Palladio's projects are a means to construct this territory, not through the continuity of urbanization, but through the finite forms of um, architecture. I think the, the best uh, chapter, the one I like the most the book, is the one on Piranesi, because he's also an architect I studied a lot and had incredible uh, influence on my work. And he's, um, I try to read Piranesi as a sort of counter project of another uh, fundamental project, which is the which actually was very important for Piranesi's uh, formation, which is the drawing of the famous uh, Pianta Grande di Roma by Giovan Battista Nolli. I'm, I'm sure you know this map. It's a very famous uh, map, which is always uh, misunderstood as a map that uh, shows the public space versus private space. I don't know if... Uh, usually that's the way this, this map is uh, known. But in fact, the uh, Nolli map uh, had a very specific... Uh, Gola, uh, which was to, uh, re uh, first of all, no uh, Nolli himself has a very interesting background because before to come to Rome, he had experience as a cadastral, uh, let's say, surveyor. So he had a lot of experience with measurement uh, and also with uh, the beginning of the, let's say, the, uh, let's say, um, link between uh, sur survey, geographical survey and uh, economic, uh, let's say, uh, performance of uh, territory. That's very important in the Nolli map because, in fact, the Nolli map uh, is a sort of latent uh, master plan for the city. And, in fact, what is uh, architecture, these objects are what had to remain fixed. And the black part was what was susceptible to be uh, transformed and changed. And, in fact, uh, Piranesi's uh, work can be seen as a kind of critique of that. Uh, sort of managerial understanding of the city, where in fact the city is made by uh, autonomous uh, forms. And for me, it's very interesting, especially how a fundamental source of uh, Piranesi's reconstruction of ancient Rome, the Campo Marzio, was uh, fueled by the Antiquità Romane, which is an incredible uh, attempt to map all ancient ruins of Rome. But of course, Piranesi uh, on, uh, mo uh, mainly focus on uh, tombs. And in fact, if you see the Campo Marzio, it's a, very, it's a reconstruction of ancient Rome, but most of the buildings he used to reconstruct Rome are buildings that are tombs. And Piranesi actually chose this for, first of all, because tombs were, didn't have uh, architectural orders. Piran uh, Piranesi is very anti-Vitruvian anti uh, architect. And second, because they really have this sort of uh, form that uh, it's very uh, within itself. And in fact, um, the Antiquità Romana is all about walls, uh, 
big walls, uh, big foundations. Uh, Piranesi is obsessed uh, with uh, foundations. He makes these totally exa uh, exaggerated uh, sections of buildings. So, like, for example, the most impressive one is the section of the uh, Mole Adriana, you know, the famous Castel Sant'Angelo. Uh, I don't know if you have seen this famous uh, print, uh, but I strongly, I mean, you can Google it after my talk because it's fantastic, one of the most crazy uh, drawings ever made in architecture, where in fact the mole is a very small thing and then he has these huge, gigantic uh, foundations, which actually are very interesting because they are half true and, but I mean, they are, I mean, it's, Piranesi is never uh, working just with his own imagination. He always exaggerates real things. And in fact, his work can also be seen as a critique of archaeological, uh, let's say, um, studies on the city, which actually were rising at that time, and which, of course, were, uh, the rise of archaeology was very much parallel to the rise of urbanization, because both shared this kind of scientific, matter-of-fact approach uh, towards the city. And in, in his project can be seen really as a reaction to, to that, uh, drawing these uh, projects where the difference between antiquarian uh, erudition and, and reality is completely uh, blurred. And finally, the last project is uh, Unger's uh, project on Berlin, of which uh, 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 Berlin as a Green Archipelago is the final outcome. It's a project that sees the collaboration between uh, the young uh, Rem Kolas and Ungers, uh, where in fact the city uh, was uh, reduced in two uh, layers, a sort of continuous uh, grid, which in, uh, in the intentions of the project was supposed to be a forest full of all kinds of urban, uh, let's say, infrastructures and uh, agricultural uh, fields, and the city, which was reduced to a series of islands. And uh, in a way, the two were really um, seen as, 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 a, as a sort of productive antithesis. And uh, for me, actually, this, actually I, uh, the, the, this project, which in the, the book is at the end, was the beginning of because for me, the encounter with this project was absolute, and the, with the work of Ungers, uh, which, of course, uh, 10 years ago, when I started to, to work on these uh, things, was, uh, Ungers was uh, totally forgotten and and consider totally the most unfashionable architect you could never, uh, you know, um, talk about. I remember the first uh, presentation I gave at the Berlage Institute about my work. People were reacting, saying this was the most reactionary architect, which uh, I shouldn't uh, deal with. Huh? But for me, actually, this was very important. Huh? And maybe I'm also reactionary, I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> actually, what is interesting uh, about this work that, uh, in a way, um, it's again uh, uh, extremely um, questioning, in a way, the idea of urbanization, because at that time, Berlin was a, a city in crisis uh, in the 70s, where people actually were leaving the city. And so Berlin had this major uh, urban crisis. I mean, one of the fundamental aspects of urbanization is the question of population. So the moment actually people leave uh, a city, uh, the city actually missed the most important uh, ingredient, which is basically its population in, in the biopolitical, let's say, terms that uh, Svenolov um, has uh, introduced. So in a way, I found interesting that they took that crisis, uh, that moment of depopulation of the city as, a child, as, as the only way to reconstruct a form of the city, not in a kind of nostalgic way, but in a very, let's say, radical and, and proactive way. And so that's actually uh, where the project, uh, the book ends. Uh, it's interesting that the book I'm uh, working right now uh, deals exactly with the uh, sea, uh, not with the islands. So I'm, I'm now working actually on a research that uh, analyzes actually the, the parallel, let's say, project of the sea and not the project of the islands. So in a way, the issues that uh, Svenolov has introduced within the architectural discourse are now for me becoming very important. Uh, and in a way, it's also a way for me to criticize my island's uh, project. Uh, but I, I really believe in this kind of uh, struggle, this conflict. Maybe it's a bit too uh, clear cut. Uh, it's a bit like two figure ground uh, dichotomy, but 
for me was very productive to, in a way, understand uh, uh, what at the end is actually uh, the, the thing I'm looking for, which is not only the, the meaning of architecture, but also the meaning of architecture within, within the city. Thanks. I mean, obviously, as you say, you, you're stressing this kind of idea of, of the finite object that has a certain autonomy, that's in certain sense is even absolute. And so on one level, there's a sense of, let's say, of distance, detachment, moving away from the fabric of urban life. But on the other hand, there's also a second movement, which is about that these finite objects somehow interject and they, they, they contain and they mirror, they reflect. They are not really absolute. They are not... They are autonomous precisely in the sense that Adorno would speak of the autonomy of aesthetic objects because they you know, embody or interject the formal contradictions of society as contradictions in their own form. And, and so in that sense, they would also have a kind of critical purchase on the world. They would not just withdraw and, and make a cesura, but they would also act upon the... Yeah, the absolutely. Uh, and how do you see, it? wouldn't there be like a tension between the idea of detachment here and also the, the idea of an active intervention? In, in absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly the uh, sort of movements I try to describe and which is becoming even more important in my um, more recent work. And I, found, I think that that movement is unsolvable. In a way, the tension uh, remains. And I always thought that the most uh, autonomous uh, architectural forms at the end are those who are always at the end engaging the city in the most uh, radical way. And usually those forms that try to merge with the city are those who become autonomous by default, by simply mimicking uh, their either cultural or physical context. So um, in that sense, yes, definitely. And that's what, what you just say is exactly what uh, I'm interested the way I always try to argue the idea of uh, absoluteness. Uh, and, and also uh, the reason why very often my work has been misunderstood as a, just a plea for autonomy in the conventional sense uh, that architects usually uh, talk about. And in that sense, I'm happy that you made this comment because it's exactly what I'm trying to, to argue. But if one looks at the general drift of the book, I, re I haven't read it as carefully as it deserves because I just got it three days ago, so, so <laughs> quickly. So maybe I'm missing some points here. But I mean, I think you're setting up, I mean, already in the introduction, you're setting up a distinction which then becomes more and more emphasized, which is the distinction between urbanism as, as you know, from started out to archizum and onwards. Then we have this idea of formal autonomy. Or let's say this kind of idea of uh, Right. But with that, and, and from your point of view, at least in this book, the, potentially, the potentiality for being critical resides with this idea of autonomy. But is there no potential for being critical inside the other field? Yes. I, well, that's like what, what I'm working right now, in a way. With the seed. Yes, absolutely. Um, actually, one of, you know, my, one, one of my recent uh, articles was on Hilbert Seimer who is, is really the architect of the city, <laughs> in the sense that Hilbert Seimer, uh, in spite of the, his reputation, which is always uh, seen as a you know, monotonous uh, architect and planner, but he wrote a lot about the city. Um, and he really tried to engage in, with the most uh, uh, reified uh, conditions of urbanization, from Berlin in the 1920s, uh, the, third, uh, city, the third largest city at that time, with a, a rising population of white-collar workers. So Hilbert Seimer is the first theorist of the post fordist uh, city because all his projects deal with immaterial labor as becoming the most, uh, let's say, important engine of uh, the city. And his writings are extremely uh, innovative in, in really trying to define this critical position uh, within the uh, sea. Actually, what is interesting that uh, Hilbert Seimer, unlike Mies, is uh, openly uh, uh, politically engaged, uh, very much associated with the Social Democratic Party in Germany. Uh, even actually in his late period in the US, he's uh, very much, uh, uh, let's say, uh, politically uh, oriented. And in his work actually is really an attempt to deal with that condition. 
So I, I think I'm, what I'm doing now is, it's, um, is to find also a critical dimension within, within that uh, grid, within, I mean, the grid in the, not in the figurative sense, but in the sense of the, the vast uh, sea of urbanization, which is more difficult than the islands, <laughs> but uh, very important. I mean, if one looks at this concept of the archipelago, which is used throughout the book, the archipelago then being this, on the one hand, the, the, the finitude and the autonomy of the islands, on the other hand, the fact that they interact and there's a sea and there's a kind of flow going on between them. Uh, I mean, there's a certain, there's very interesting passages where you have to distinguish your position from that on Colin Rowe, for instance, yes. about the collage city, which is a kind of neoliberal, aestheticized idea of, of architectural forms being just somehow juxtaposed and deprived of their historical, of their historical reference. Uh, and you have to, on the other hand, you have to argue that your position is something entirely different, or perhaps it somehow mimics the collage city, but it does something entirely different. And yes. I would like to hear a bit more about that, how you relate to that idea. Yes, uh, well, actually, uh, it's very important to uh, uh, say something about the relationship between Ungers and Colin Rove, because uh, in the late 60s, um, uh, Colin Rove invi uh, invited uh, Ungers to teach at Cornell, uh, Ungers was teaching in Berlin in the 1960s uh, and of course with the outburst of uh, 1968 uh, his approach which was very much architectural was seen as uh, fascist by the students so he had no chances to continue his work in the uh, German university so he was invited by Colin Rove to teach at Cornell and Colin Rove invited Ungers believing that their approach was very similar so that the archipelago, in a way, was uh, very similar to what he was working at that time, which later on would become College City. And actually, what is interesting is that the moment uh, Ungers uh, becomes the chairman of Cornell, a huge war conflict uh, emerged between uh, Colin Rove uh, and Ungers, because they both realized that their projects was <laughs> radically different. And the difference has to do mainly with the fact that for uh, Colin Rove, Urban composition, at the end, is a, is, is an, a, a matter of figures. And the only criteria to compose these figures is a pure, uh, let's say, aesthetic, formal, let's say, uh, approach, uh, where, in fact, uh, quality, uh, the judgment of quality becomes very important. And, in fact, there is a, so a sort of interesting parallel between the work of Colin Rove uh, and the work of Clement Greenberg. Of course, they, they have nothing to do with each other, but their taken on formalism is very similar, where at the end, the only uh, criteria to judge if something is good or bad is, is pure is a ju judgment of quality. And of course, uh, for Ungers, uh, uh, the uh, composition of the islands is not simply a composition of figures, but is a sort of analogical system which involves uh, qualities or uh, let's say, aspects of the city which are not immediately perceivable in, 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 the, in the figures themselves, but the figures nevertheless uh, create. No? And in fact, what is interesting about this project, uh, that uh, Ungers actually present this project with a se series of uh, vignettes and, and photographs of many other projects, which he used as a sort of, um, as a sort of uh, not catalog, but uh, analogical machine to make this uh, selection uh, possible. So the selection is not, uh, as in Colin Rove, uh, made of uh, individual figures, uh, but it's basically uh, what, let's say, today in, in kind of uh, post operaist terms, I would call the actualization of the common. So the common is this kind of potentiality of the urban condition. The islands are like singular manifestation of this uh, common. Well, in Colin Rove, the common does not exist. Figures are completely individuals, and they do not share anything uh, if not the fact that they are just floating in this kind of uh, value-free compositions. Because there's one point in the book where you say that the, the I mean, even though the, 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 these islands are opposed and, and enter into dialectical relationships with each other, they also have a kind of secret relation to an absent center. And, Absolutely. And I think you call this the totality of the city, and that was a bit unclear to me. What is this? That would be the common. The common, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's actually what I'm now trying to define, uh, which is exactly, I mean, what I call the absent fatherland, which, by the way, is an expression I took from a very important book, which was extremely influential in the writing of this book, uh, 
book by Massimo Cacciari, uh, The Archipelago. Um, I mean, the definition of the archipelago for Cacciari is exactly this. Islands are never reducible to one entity, and yet they all share this absent, I mean, in his uh, Schmittian, Heideggerian terms, he would call uh, absent fatherlands. And that's exactly, for me, the common, yeah. in a way. Something that no singularity can ex reduce, exhaust in one object, in one architecture, but nevertheless, every architecture is an expression of that uh, common, in a way. The common is embedded in these singularities, but no singularity can exhaust uh, the common. And in fact, two things were very important for me right now to further, uh, you know, this to further define this, which were on one end the, uh, the work on the common made by Paolo Virno, uh, and uh, uh, also Aldo Rossi's uh, studies on typology, where he was trying to actually develop this sort of uh, common in, in, in architecture, in architectural form, and in the urban uh, condition. Now, um, I haven't read Cacciari's book, but I will surely do it. It sounds very interesting. And, and there's another reference here which, which comes to mind, which perhaps is a bit dangerous in an architecture school, but, but I'm thinking about the work on Jean-François Lyotard, you know, in, in his in his early work from the 80s, or his late work from the 80s, like 1983, where he was still talking about postmodernism, absolutely not in the sense of architectural discussions, but in, in philosophy. He also used the, the, this idea of the archipelago. I mean, he said that we have to understand language as an archipelago uh, made up of islands, which consists of regimes of phrases, be they scientific, cognitive, philosophical, ethical, aesthetical, but they can never merge into one thing. But still, we have to accept the idea of, of the ocean, of the archipelagos, which is like what they somehow are immersed in. But we can never see this see, as it were, for itself. We can only feel the presence of something Absolutely. which is never there. So in that sense, I don't know if, if, if Cacciari quotes Lyotard, but it comes very, very close to Well, actually, uh, there, uh, in Italy there's been a lot of debates uh, about Cacciari's work, whether it, it's uh, postmodern or, or not. And one of the issues where, one of the points of discussion is exactly the uh, fact that Cacciari always stressed this idea that the, the sea uh, in its totality is, is, is unknown, it can only be known by this constant, uh, let's say, uh, moving through, uh, through islands. And of course, uh, I don't know actually very well the work of Lyotard. And of course, one of the reasons why I, I was never attracted by him is because when I was a student, uh, the beginning of my studies, it was really very much spoiled by all these postmodern uh, <laughs> architects and, and, and vulgadas, let's say. Yeah. Uh, but actually, um, well, in, in my work, for sure, uh, um, I mean, I'm not, I mean, what, one of the main resources, of, and it's also in this book, has been the, the work of, of, uh, of operaism, I mean, the, especially the work of Mario Tronti. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Tronti always uh, stressed, you know, the way he described, uh, the subjectivity of, 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 of the workers' movement is exactly the possibility of the part to define um, the whole. So, uh, not, of course, in exhaustive terms, but in the terms of, of creating this kind of point of entry, this kind of uh, sort of um, section. Uh, and I think that sort of main, uh, way of thinking uh, has been very important for me. I mean, if, if one would look at your earlier book, The Project of Autonomy, there's a certain connection here between. So Absolutely, I was, yes. I was going to ask you if you could say something about how you would connect that to your particular Italian experience and the operaista movement, the idea of autonomy. Well, actually, one of the most uh, important lessons of uh, operaism, I don't know if you are familiar uh, with this movement, but it's a very important movement that um, took place in Italy uh, in the 1960s. And in a way still today is kind of alive because many of the uh, protagonists are not only alive but they also write and continue to actually uh, work on that uh, line of research. And one of the interesting, um, let's say, uh, lessons of this movement was that unlike many Marxist movements, they have been always interested not only in conservative thinkers, so, uh, in a way, uh, Adam Smith uh, or Carl Schmitt are more interesting than, than Mao or, or, or uh, David Harvey, I don't know. 
uh, but um, that's also uh, the, 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 uh, it's very important and fruitful to always uh, go back to the classics of political theory. And in a way, um, in my book, uh, you know, uh, I tried to, to do the same. Uh, instead of actually discussing the contemporary city by simply referring to the most, uh, let's say, up-to-date uh, examples. So in a way, I try to go back to the classics, if you want, of architecture. In the same way, uh, Birn or Negri go back to Spinoza or, or to, uh, you know, very, or Machiavelli. So I think uh, for me this was a very important lesson because today um, these architects or these historical references, Palladio, Spiranesi, are the victims of this endless, uh, let's say, uh, scholar production uh, that has made them completely, um, sorry, I hate this uh, uh, kind of, <laughs> um, which have made them completely useless. Uh, and in my book, I tried to actually uh, make this material like militant uh, again. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm clear enough, uh, but in that sense, the, the, the lesson of, uh, of operaism has been very important. We're also going to have some questions from the audience. I just want to ask one more question. I, I read some reviews on the book I just found on the net just this morning, and a couple of them complained that, that you really end somewhere in the late 70s. And you, some of the reviewers said, I would like to have a conclusion, and I would like to have a reference to something contemporary going on. I know this is, a, of course, an, always a silly question, why didn't you write some other chapters? But still, if, if, if you, would, you would, let's say, point to something in the, in the present that you would feel would be an interesting example of what you're proposing here, what, what would that be? Uh, yeah, uh, nothing. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't think uh, uh, history is a linear thing that has always, uh, is always producing relevant things. I think in history there are major moments and minor moments. This uh, is a minor moment. I think this is a minor moment. It's like, you know, you have the Baroque, which is a great period, and then you have the Rococo, which is a minor period. And I think today we are in the Rococo uh, period. And, you know, <laughs> I don't think that the... Uh, I, I mean, for me, of course, the work of Rem Colas is very important but more as an antithesis of my work, rather than something I, I um, you know, taken as an example. I'm very critical, but I acknowledge, I recognize that for me, he's the only one who has really um, a, a discourse about architecture. He's not just producing uh, buildings, because all the other uh, architects, they just produce buildings. And for me, architecture is not about uh, design. Architecture is it's really a, a way of thinking about the world on which a design is, of course, one, one aspect. So in that sense, I found very difficult to find uh, contemporary uh, examples uh, which are uh, relevant uh, to my own discourse, which means that maybe my own discourse is completely obsolete. And maybe we have entered uh, a, a total different way to think and to do architecture. And I, I'm kind of, uh, I'm ready also to accept that kind of uh, condition. So I'm, I'm, I've been always very attracted by the, uh, not Prometeo, but the other one, who is um, the opposite of Prometeo is, uh, you know, there is another, you know, Prometeo is the one who anticipates. Yeah. And Epimetheus, then, yeah, yeah. Exactly, who actually is the one that think afterwards. Yeah. And maybe I'm more that kind of, uh, <laughs> That kind of person, you know, people like Spengler or, or you know, the Wittgenstein himself, you know, who think that, uh, that there is, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm not, I never, I don't have this complex to, to be, to say something new or something necessarily optimistic towards uh, the future. I mean, I'm not, I don't have that urgency. I think that uh, in this book especially, I wanted to, analyze the present condition by going back to uh, certain passages which for me are very important to understand where we are right now. Yeah. Well, I would assume I'm just going to say this final thing before I love for our questions, but I think, I think a lot of architects 
I assume would be very happy about this book because it is also kind of defense of the the classical values of architecture about the profession about architecture should not be dissolved let's say into urban theory or theories about flows or networks or whatever but it should remain something which is is the kind of emphatic creation of something which is an object so in that sense it is a very strong defense of of of, of architecture yes i mean a profound love i mean yeah. i i really love architecture and in a way the book is also a Precisely about that, um, and I don't know if architects are happy. I mean, maybe not. <laughs> maybe some. <are. laughs> we'll see. But for sure, yes, that was a motivation also, very, which was very important. Okay, maybe we have other questions. I don't have a very. Um, um, Smart question. <laughs> I'm just, uh, thank you for your talk and um, what? So many times within your story, uh, I've been mentioned about the word. So, and you still haven't mentioned the word. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Tafuri is, uh, is very important uh, for me, it was very important, but. Um, more the Tafuri on uh, Renaissance than Tafuri on uh, modern architecture, because I think that Tafuri on modern architecture was, um, is very uh, a peculiar Tafuri. It was a Tafuri of critique of ideology, and critique of ideology is a, a sort of critique among comrades. Uh, so you do a critique of ideology uh, when the movement to, you, to which you belong uh, um, is very powerful, but at the same time on the risk of um, becoming progressive in a kind of uh, stupid way, becoming reformist. So Tafuri's work uh, was a way to warn uh, his comrades about this uh, possibility of being too reformist and believing in reformism and, become, and being cheated by capital. And the moment actually that sort of uh, movement uh, uh, collapse. Of course, that, that need, uh, that critique was, uh, became completely outdated. And for me, the way uh, Tafuri is read today, uh, it's, sometimes it's almost like uh, um, I found it very uh, hilarious because this aspect is completely forgotten. And Tafuri was not talking to architects in the sense of, he was talking to uh, people who at that time were active in unions, active in, uh, in the party, and say, let's be careful about reformism. Let's be very radical about exactly those leftist values that inhabit the progressive culture of architecture. So that was the Tafuri's project of modern architecture. And I think that that project, uh, for me, it's totally gone. It doesn't make sense anymore. The most interesting Tafuri is Tafuri on Renaissance, especially of his last uh, book, which for me is his best book. Uh, uh, Ricerca del Rinascimento, which in English, uh, the title in English, I forgot it, but uh, something similar, uh, where Tafuri really tried to understand the origin of modern architecture. The introduction is beautiful. It's one of the, it's Tafuri at its best, where he actually, it's a, it, the whole introduction is, is a sort of questioning bit cover idealism on Renaissance architecture and the idea of proportions as and actually, I, uh, for me, that, that project, that introduction, if you read the introduction, is exactly uh, one of the things that inspired me in, in, in my work. Uh, actually, Tafuri on Serlio. I mean, he wrote a, a, a magnificent essay on Serlio and how Serlio's uh, reformist uh, Protestant uh, you know, ideology drives him away from monumental architecture and, you know, and whereas, you know, drive him towards uh, the issue of housing, uh, the issue of uh, urban management. Uh, and that's actually the, the real Tafuri, the Tafuri that interests me a lot. I'm not interested anymore in Tafuris uh, of Contropiano because, uh, I mean, I'm interested as an historical thing, but I don't think today it makes any sense to, to think that uh, uh, Tafuri was not criticizing capital. He was criticizing the, the leftist architects who were trying to change <laughs> uh, that kind of condition. So today we don't have leftist architects anymore. Yeah. 
physical manifestations of other, of other such. Isn't this, I mean, that is also in what relates to your work on the idea of the possibility of natural architecture. <laughs> In what sense can really the physical manifestations of the architects to build with themselves? Um, however, pos position really, you know, in the record of the, of the city, uh, how can they act as kind of critical um, political agents in a sense? Which is what today is not necessarily architects are leftists, but still trying to know that there were some kind of social or political potential. How would you? I mean, how would you relate to that? Well, actually, I mean, yeah. Tafuri chase, of course, of the day cannot be. I mean, you know, political architecture. Well, Tafuri, Tafuri's uh, latest. Uh, I mean, its main uh, uh, focus, which I found also very important in my work, it's not. It's neither architecture as a mere physical thing, nor architecture as a virtual uh, thing, but it's architecture as a project, and the. The, the idea of the project is for me what is the essence of what we call architecture and what makes architecture different from what comes before architecture, which is basically just the art of building. And has to do with the idea that uh, for a certain historical moment, architects uh, were not just building you know, things, they were designing things. They were actually putting forward a project and this project is made, of course, of drawings, uh, of values, of effects, of imagination, of perceptions, uh, and eventually also physical uh, objects. But I, in my work, I don't stress, I, I, at least that's what I think, I hope, uh, the physical object as the only embodiment of the possibility of the absolute architecture. In fact, I mean, one of the, I mean, <laughs> the uh, Boulle or Piranesi, they didn't build almost, uh, anything, and yet uh, their architecture, the language, for me, is, uh, is very important. Uh, so, in that sense, I think the idea of the project is very important. I think the, 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 uh, we don't uh, understand uh, maybe anymore the importance of the, I mean, of the project as an instrument of, produ of producing architecture, and how that uh, dimension of architecture is not only the true dimension of architecture, maybe this is, sounds a very essentialist argument, but what in the 15th century came as, as, as the way architects started to engage with architecture. And I do believe that in the project there is a, a fundamental side of uh, political engagement with architecture. It's still today. Uh, and I think that we are, we are the first to that had to believe in that, because most of our investment, uh, it's a really an investment towards a project. I'm sure that all of you inside this room have a project. Maybe you don't have it, but you have it. Um, and so I think this for me is very important. This is actually for me the real side of politics, not just architecture as a, as a, as a form, as a pure form, uh, devoid of any, let's say, project uh, or activism uh, or, you know, direct engagement. For me, the project is uh, very political, which can go from a PhD to a lifelong uh, project to something that is also co more collective. I just want to add something about Tafuri. Are you, are you asking something else? Or? Yes, yes, okay. So, I mean, even though, even though the, obviously the context differs now from the late 60s and early 70s, and, but when you're presenting this idea about, for instance, the way you describe Hilbersheimer, you connect him to a certain discourse on space, all of this is very close to Tafuri. I mean, his book, even though that disappears in the English, English translation, Progetto Utopia, is one of the, I think, still a very intriguing genealogy for the idea of the project. And, and the way he describes the historical logic, it's not entirely... Not, not, this not entirely, uh, it's very close to what you're saying. I mean. Well, I, I, I mean, for me, it's fine. I mean, I, I, for sure, again, someone who had a uh, huge influence on, on my work, I mean, I, could, I cannot deny that. But I think that, uh, again, I, I, I want to emphasize that uh, Tafuri's main goal was critique of ideology, something that it's not really, I mean, it's made me present in my work as well, uh, but um, in, I'm not, not with the same, if you want, apocalyptic uh, sharpness. 
And I think that that has to do with the fact that I want to uh, find a place uh, where architecture uh, is again possible. While Tafuri actually was uh, uh, in, you know, confronted in a situation where architecture was really impossible. In the terms that Tafuri wanted architecture to be. Yeah. Uh, I think it was good that you said this about the project because I found it a bit hard to follow from the sort of architect's engagement with managing the city as a whole and then arguing for the island. So I didn't quite see the sort of passage from one to the other. But based on what you were saying about defining some other border between architecture and the city, uh, and you started with the illustration of architecture sort of growing out of the city walls, you know. So my question is, what, what do you, I'm wondering, I'm curious about the role of the facade, because in Connor Road, the facade is really important as kind of representation of that border. Right. So I'm just curious to know. Yes, I know, the, the border actually, in, in my book, the border I try to emphasize is not so much the facade, but more the, the very stoppage that's an architectural form, uh, whatever it is, uh, imply the fact that uh, whenever architecture exists, it immediately establishes a boundary, uh, which in some cases, of course, can be a facade. But in a way, for example, in the work I'm doing right now, especially on, on Serlio, you can see that the facade uh, of a building uh, is no longer really a border uh, in the sense of really creating this kind of uh, cutting edge. Um, condition, but it's more a kind of managerial device. Actually, facades, uh, you know, buildings be in, before the Middle Age didn't have facades. Uh, they had only walls. The facade actually is invented, uh, let's say, in the Middle Age uh, as a way to uh, create this interface between public and private uh, space. Uh, and and in, it, in a way, it's created in order to control this interface, to give to uh, uh, you know, this interface, which has a kind of uh, economic and, and social function, a sort of ma man managerial apparatus. And in fact, you have architects like Serlio and later on Lemue, who actually really work on this idea of the facade as a kind of instrument to control and to give to private property a sort of recognizable mask form. No? So in that sense, I, I, I think the facade for me is really an anti-border. Uh, it look, I mean, it has that kind of border condition, but is uh, at the end uh, uh, what ties in in an extremely, uh, let's say, uh, strong way uh, the, the the object to its uh, uh, urban to the urban space. Yeah. Actually, I uh, that's why I show the the foundations of Piranesi, no, because you know Piranesi. Uh, was uh, very much attacked by French theorists of architecture because uh, they thought that his work was uh, negating the importance of Greek architecture before Roman architecture. And one of the reasons why they were making this critique because one of the fundamental source of uh, Piranesi's work was Etruscan architecture. And Etruscan architecture uh, is an architecture mainly made of walls, of huge cyclopic, uh, you know, with walls with cyclopic stones, so walls that really has this anti-facade, if you want, appearance. Uh, and in that sense, that, that is for me really a border. I think the facade is really an anti-border. Because it takes on this role to be representative. Yes. Which the wall is sort of performative in a different way. Absolutely, absolutely. Abs I just want to give an illustration. That's a very good uh, definition. I'm really interested. I've been looking a lot at Constantinople and quite at Istanbul and so on. And the ancient palace in, in Constantinople was a system of spaces and of passages through spaces. And it was a really sort of tower spatial mechanism. And then they moved the great palace to inhabit the wall of Constantinople instead. And that's where you get the facade. Yes. So it's, I'm just really interested in what is that movement in terms of spatial structures, you know, representation of power, but also what kind of spatial mechanism that is. What, what is that shift? I think that shift is exactly the moment in which uh, 
the construction of the city moves from boundaries, from what I describe as the temenos uh, condition, to urbanization, where in fact uh, borders are no longer uh, these unilateral uh, elements, but becomes this kind of the dispositif, uh, organizational apparatuses. And in fact, I mean, it's interesting that today uh, the experience of a wall uh, is almost impossible because every uh, wall is either dematerialized, uh, it's, I mean, it's even stronger than ancient walls uh, in terms of really, you know, creating kind of border conditions, but the form completely disappears. That's why actually contemporary architecture, uh, it's all about uh, glass, transparency, you know. There are very few architects who are able to design a wall, uh, you know, really as, a, as, a, as an enclosing uh, element. And it's all about uh, transparency, you know. And of course, we know that that's, it's a fiction, that in, in reality, borders are stronger than ever. So in that sense, that passage you described, which is very interesting, uh, which is actually the thing I'm, I'm working now, is exactly the passage from uh, when, in fact, uh, you know, control shift from a rather recognizable uh, edges uh, to a much more uh, diffuse uh, system. And in fact, it's the moment in which, for example, uh, you know, city walls disappeared. The city itself uh, the, becomes a defensive uh, system. Uh, no longer just the, the, the walls on the perimeter, but uh, the street, uh, you know, the way the urban pattern itself is, uh, is designed. Um, and that sense, I think that's actually, what, that's actually how I would explain that passage. And, and that is actually where the facade becomes very important, becomes a fundamental object of design. Haussmann, Lemoué, uh, César Dali, all these uh, planners were obsessed with the idea of the facade as a kind of, uh, you know, apparatus, as a, as a dispositif of urban, uh, you know, of urban design. I have a, a question that perhaps... I have two questions, and they're both addressed to both of you. <laughs> uh, not to be an architect, uh, it's rather easy to see architecture as ideology. Yeah. I mean, that is, I mean, that's, that's, I guess that's the same case. I mean, to me, the first critique of ideology is a critique of architecture. I mean, because architecture, as separated from the action of the, uh, the performance of the building, is ideology. Uh, and I would like this to hear, I mean, both of you reflect on that. And also, I would like to return to, to the notion of apparatus and, and also the notion of, of the kind of the omnipresent apparatus, uh, and that is also, I mean, uh, thinking of Jugger Gamba's reading of, of apparatus and mm -hmm. of course, why I've called this people back to the realness and the economia. So in a sense, it's, we have the all senses of the apparatus of the dispositive present at the same time, already from the beginning in if we amount this, we said this beginning is <coughs> at least a beginning in a possible beginning in a in, 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 in Greek city. Uh, uh, help me here. <laughs> so, how would you see those? You begin. Well, I think that uh, well, the comment about architecture, is, uh, yes, I mean, but you know, the problem is that starting with that argument, uh, I'm afraid then you end up in a cul de sac. Uh, because you can al also say language uh, is a, an ideological apparatus. But then, you know, so what? So th we don't speak anymore? You know, we refuse to speak? Uh, I think language is also productive. I mean, I think language is not a, just uh, an ideological thing. It's also the way we construct, we articulate a, a public sphere or, or a space that we can share. So me, architecture is the same. Yes, of course, it's highly ideological. It's been always... Uh, influenced by all kinds of powers that have instrumentalized space to govern uh, people. So I don't believe that the architecture came for free. Architecture came as an instrument to organize subjectivity, to produce actually subjects. And so I'm the first to be aware of that. But at the same time, it's inevitable that to be together, to share uh, a space, we need an edge, we need something that articulates that space. So architecture is also important in that sense. Huh? 
And I think uh, it has to be always uh, re be reclaimed from its possibility to just become an instrument of oppression or an instrument of alienation or a purely ideological instrument in the hands of uh, what kind of power. Yes, but in his case, uh, the difference was that, again, we really have to uh, understand that Tafuri produced that critique in a very particular historical moment, uh, uh, which was actually, uh, what Tafuri was criticizing actually was the welfare state, and the belief uh, that uh, through uh, large-scale uh, design and, and, and architectural, let's say, projects at you know, with a certain kind of progressive uh, direction, you would uh, be able to govern capital. So that was what Tafuri was uh, criticizing. Uh, and Tafuri made clear uh, that his critique, I was his student, the reason why he didn't want to uh, reopen this discussion, because he said that critique was based on that particular moment. So it makes no sense to carry on this critique forever. My work has to do with uh, the present condition, which is very different, where in fact what Tafuri was criticizing is gone, is dead. I mean, the, 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 and, and actually what we are left uh, with are ruins. Uh, and my work is trying to make sense of these ruins in a way that they, cannot, uh, they can be seen not just as the uh, Architectura Sassinae, uh, which is the famous drawing Tafuri put in the cover of uh, the English edition of uh, architecture and utopia, but as the beginning of something, something else, as the clues uh, through which to reconstruct uh, a possible uh, city. So in that sense, I think uh, my work is <laughs> different, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm, again, I want to stress the fact that uh, for me, his work is uh, terribly important, and I've read uh, basically not only everything, but I have read everything several times, <laughs> and uh, but uh, I, I think that I also know that uh, his work has limits. And if we want to continue that research, we have to start precisely where he left uh, his, his research. I mean, okay, you know, it's a very long discussion, yeah. but um, I, I think that... Um, I think that for me, the, the, his work, uh, it's relevant only you know, within the moment he made that, that critique. And I think that uh, that moment is no longer here, so I think we have other, uh, let's say, uh, issues uh, that uh, Tafuri couldn't address in his work. I mean, biopolitics, for example. I mean, the, 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 all this, uh, for me, you know, after uh, Foucault and after all this discussion on, on biopolitics, which Tafuri completely uh, missed, I mean, you cannot simply repeat uh, Tafuri's critique. It's impossible. No, uh, I, maybe I should say I, I just agree. That's maybe too short. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's obvious that Tafuri's work has receded from us, belongs to the past. And this idea of a critique of, let's say, of reformists as an ideology is no longer possible. It makes very little sense in Sweden to criticize, let's say, leftist reformism today. We, sh we shoot <laughs> on the Red Cross, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but still, I mean, I, is the concept of the, is the very concept of ideology still relevant? That of course depends on what you mean by ideology. I mean, if you look at let's say contemporary let's say social science and political science, there's absolutely no agreement about how the term ideology should be used. Is it? I mean, Tafuri used it in a very particular late Marxist sense in the 60s, and I think very few would use the term ideology today in that sense. So, so I, yes, of course, architecture is ideology reflects ideologies, it is a materialization of social practices which are themselves ideological, etc. I, I just think one has to be careful about how one uses the term ideology. And, 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 uh, and I think that the idea of a critical theory, which is being questioned by many today in name of, you know, of the post-critical or the projective or the, the pragmatic or, or, or whatnot, uh, I think this rejection of, of critical theory today is dependent on a simplistic idea of ideology. Simply, I think ideology works in many ways today, and this is not really answering your question, but I think, yes, architecture is ideology, sure, but then one has to move on, as you were saying, and, and think ideology in, even in somehow m much more, let's say, let's say, diversified and nuanced, and also 
micrological way, ideology works in so many ways. It's, it's, it's not just a, a sense of, say, ideology being a false, a false representation. Because I think all the critique of the philosophy of representation, we've had that for like 40 years, we have to think of ideology itself as a kind of material practice. In that sense, you have, I think you have a more interesting way of connecting theories of ideology to architecture than saying that architecture is a representation that somehow twists or blurs a correct presentation of society. Because architecture, as you say, it actually produces something. It produces affectivities, yeah. bodies, desires. In that sense, it is ideology, yeah. but not in the sense of a false representation of anything. Yeah. Absolutely. But also, I mean, if there is a, a place where I would do critique of ideology today, this is certainly uh, towards the rise of activism as a new practice of architecture. Um, you know that, I don't know what is the situation in Sweden, but in many countries in Europe, you know, with the uh, fact that with economic recession, more and more offices are very much engaged in these kind of activist uh, projects, which very often are consisting of creating events and sort of self-help uh, uh, scenarios for local communities. And it's really interesting because the way they brand uh, this new movement is all about uh, proactivity and being uh, against uh, the stardom and making architecture as a, as a grassroots uh, activity. But it's really interesting to see now how in times of um, extreme scarcity, uh, economic scarcity, uh, and, and you know, the transformation of everything into entrepreneurial uh, Darwinian process, this idea of activism is becoming really a form of ideology. So uh, many developers are engaging these activists uh, to create this kind of self-help uh, conditions for real estate development. Uh, for example, in Holland, uh, you have uh, developers hiring artists to do events, cultural events in their own, uh, let's say, neighborhoods, to create this kind of participation. No? And of course, we know that this participation becomes really a, a means for these developers to boost uh, a rather dark uh, economic uh, condition, to create life, which then, of course, is parasite to raise the value of these uh, properties. And in a way, activism and is really performing that kind of ideological role. So if I would make a critique of ideology today, it would be exactly against this uh, you know, subjectivity, this kind of uh, approach, and also towards the idea of informality. You know, informal cities, informal urbanization, all these very trendy uh, exhibitions that you see all around, promoting the idea that the city has no form, it's uh, all about uh, flows, uh, and of course, uh, this is actually perfectly, uh, even if it's done with an impetus of, you know, going, you know, uh, celebrating the 99%, whatever, you see that uh, what is behind these projects is a, a potential ideological project to basically uh, find uh, for the neoliberal city a kind of uh, le le legitimacy. Uh, you know, the neoliberal city at the end is about less as fair, is leaving, you know, the city to its own... Uh, self-help uh, reproduction, and then parasiting, of course, its value only at, at the end. And in a way, I see informality, informal cities, slums, uh, you know, all this kind of new activism uh, as a possible ideological, uh, let's say, uh, performance of, of architecture. Do you all struggle with these questions? Yeah. Work in the different environments around the world. Right. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, not only role, but jobs. Uh, I mean, I, I think that there is a, a clear uh, link between precarity of freelance, uh, freelance working uh, workers. You know, we, we all, almost all people, I think, I mean, at least in this room, we are all freelance. We are freelancing, you know, to, to, to survive. And you know how this system is becoming structural in the way uh, people uh, work. Uh, and actually, activism is becoming a sort of way to create the subjectivity of a precarious researcher. You know, everything is, is initiated uh, on a kind of uh, informal way. There are no institutions anymore backing this kind of uh, uh, research. So there is a clear symmetry between precarity of work and the rise of activism. And, and again, also in this sense, activism becomes an ideological instrument 
to let believe the architect that he can basically manage with this rather uh, difficult situation, uh, you know, finding the situation in, you know, almost like idyllic to do this kind of self-help uh, projects. So that's why I think that, uh, I think that uh, if Tafuri would uh, uh, write again uh, his book, for sure this kind of, the rise of this uh, anti-institutional uh, self-help activist projects would be uh, perhaps at the very center of his critique. Yes, they are becoming, you know, uh, NGOs. You know, there is this NGOs uh, ideology. <laughs> you know, the ideology of non-governmental uh, organizations, which are becoming like the mendicant orders uh, in the 14th century, extremely powerful, but of course. Uh, preaching this idea of uh, poverty and, uh, and informality, but at the same time very much able to become these instruments of power and control in terms of cultural initiatives, but more and more also social, political initiatives. Um, and I think uh, this is for me really a, a good uh, site for a, a new... I mean, in a way also in my book, though it's not clearly uh, written, uh, in a way my book was a is a critique of that, fundamental critique... Uh, of this sort of uh, ideology of informality. So in that sense, yes, there is a critique of ideology, but of course I didn't want to use that kind of uh, theme because otherwise, you know, automatically people would immediately refer to that kind of uh, fixed idea of ideology that uh, Svenolov was mentioning before. Um, I think the idea of the project as I see it as inspired by some kind of initial political act, like acting as being the sort of central political thing, um, going back to Aristotle, Hannah Arendt, and so on. Um, but so, and I sympathize with that, but then I wonder what's the difference between the project and the entrepreneur, who is also <laughs> somebody who acts in a sense. Could you define that difference? Uh, well, it's a very good question. In a way, yes, it's true that the entrepreneurial subject uh, is forced to project all the time. You know, writing an application, you know, we are all bombarded with these kind of necessities. You know, every now and then we have to do a project. We are engaged with a project. It's a very good question. Actually, uh, I don't know how to answer, but for sure uh, the, the, the border between the two things is very thin. Uh, so I think uh, that um, you have to understand, you have to negotiate that border all the time. The intention, but also the, the way you carry on this project. The strat that not only the, the project itself, but the way, the tactics uh, you use uh, you know, for your own uh, project. For example, I strongly believe in, uh, in the uh, idea of self-valorization is a concept that was introduced by opera is thinking you know self valorization means that you are able to self valorize your own things without without actually having that value acknowledged by institutions or entrepreneurial success you know think of how we do research today we can only do research if we are funded by an, by, uh, an institution if we get the grant which, of course, is an implicit acknowledgement that what we do fits into a particular uh, scheme, entrepreneurial scheme. So I think today the question, I mean, with Martino, of course, we are confronted with that reality all the time, is how we self-valorize our research without you know, the need of an institution to give us the grant uh, and therefore to acknowledge what we are doing. And I can tell you this requires a lot of tactics, <laughs> and I think that could be perhaps the, you know, the border where you can reclaim the project against uh, the entrepreneurial project <laughs> that you were mentioning. You, yes. You know, the word project has a very interesting etymological uh, origin no? because uh, Renaissance architects were introducing this word project uh, from uh, military warfare, uh, let's say, um, from, from the art of warfare, project was the uh, trajectory, the ballist uh, trajectory of artillery. And so the project was really the art of measuring, of calculating the exact 
uh, let's say, <laughs> trajectory of, 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 a, of, a, of, of a f uh, artillery, uh, let's say, fire, power fire. So in a way, I really think the project has this kind of military dimension of being very strategic. Uh, and to be very strategic means that, uh, for example, in, in all these instances, writing an application or engaging in uh, research, you have to not simply, you know, simply take uh, everything for granted, but you have to question all these uh, thresholds and, and, and systems that, in a way, objectify our own work. Thing. I think the idea behind that is also that you don't know where it goes. Yes. It's based on calculating exactly where it's going to hit. But yes. the whole idea of the project, in different to entrepreneur, you think, is that you actually don't know where it's going to end up and where it's going to sort of disseminate and what, what its effect's going to be. Right. And I think that's also the point about architecture because um, you don't know what's going to happen to it. Absolutely. Yes. And, you know, the, this kind of grand system, uh, it's really an attempt, it's, it's really, it really fragments our own work so that, you know, you always create these filters, these buffer zones between, you know, what we do and the possible consequences of it. Yeah. Absolutely. It's unforeseeable. It's a I mean, in one way, what I... The thing I wanted to ask about, I, I guess for me, follows on that. It, it seems very nice then that within that idea of the project, there is there is one sense the golf project, which seems to be the ultra, ultimate entrepreneurial project, is that there's a very small hole very far away, and you have to calculate the swing that will land the ball. And that's that's yes, right? exactly. And then you're talking about this project as as, as something open-ended, open not applicable. You know, think of how this issue of applicability, which is exactly to hit the right target according to the institution, is important today in applying for a grant, you know? Um, what intrigues me, going back to the, I think it's very fascinating that we should, I mean, we should, it feels like now is the time for a Vitruvius conference in some way that, that suddenly, you know, there's this kind of cash text on Vitruvius, which, which we just, you know, which kind of takes up this aspect of, the other side of the architect, that there is this kind of architect who will define the organizer. In some way, the facies of an object, and there's this architect who will be this manager. Manager. And in either of those, in this classical text, is, or, or is there this dimension of, of both of these figures in that classical text seems to be ultimately entrepreneurially bound, actually. They're in the service of the wolf, they're in the service of kind of decorum and the few you know, words of decorum, which says why what I would do right. And um, at what point then is it then right to say that at what point is the other type of project invented? Is it a product? I guess it's maybe a product of the Renaissance. Yes, no, I mean, uh, Alberti for me is a very interesting uh, crit critique of Vitruvius. First of all, uh, what you said is. Very important. Actually, Vitruvius is known for the famous triad, uh, utilitas, uh, firmitas, uh, venustas. But in fact, one of the fundamental categories that Vitruvius introduced with the architectura is solertia, which is really this sort of uh, uh, ability to constantly cope with unpredictable uh, events and situations. Uh, uh, and in fact, this is ex exactly what characterized Vitruvius' project, the art of management, the art of organization. For me, the most anti-Vitruvian architect, the one that, uh, you know, critique uh, Vitruvius is Alberti. Because on one hand, Alberti, of course, uh, even further elaborate this kind of managerial dimension of architecture. Uh, you know, it's very efficient. But at the same time, uh, Alberti writes Momus, which is a fundamental attack on the uh, civil society you know, kind of project that one can find in De Familia and the Architectura, where he actually you know, uh, talks about the vagrants, the vagabond, as the only, uh, you know, free sub the only happy free subject. And at the same time, he writes in De Familia and the Architectura everything you know, about the institutions, the importance of institutions. And I always found this schizophrenia in Alberti's work 
very productive because we always need both of them. Uh, you know, maybe Agamben would go for uh, the Momus uh, against uh, the Architectura, but I believe that we need both. Uh, we need both the uh, managerial, uh, let's say, aspect, but we need this constant uh, challenge of that system. And in that sense, I, uh, for me, it was very important um, uh, Sven Olof, uh, critique of Agamben's work where he said, you know, the problem with Agamben is that his idea of freedom at the end is so ontologically uh, defined that anything that comes after, uh, it's basically the end <laughs> of that uh, condition. Well, actually, Foucault introduced a much more uh, historically uh, defined idea of freedom, which is a constant struggle between subjects and the systems that try to produce those subjects. And in that sense, I found this, uh, uh, let's say, approach very fruitful. Uh, and in, in, in that sense, is, so I think that uh, Vitruvius is very problematic. Uh, but I think that if you read Vitruvius through Alberti, it becomes extremely uh, productive and very interesting. Because I think it was also intriguing in, in, in the cash text on Vitruvius that if he would, which I think, I don't think is in Vitruvius, I think it's that he got actually by an Albertic but I think it is when he reads, kind of realizes, okay, a third of Vitruvius is about this military action um, and uh, an action about play, the art of placing objects. Um, uh, he picks up on the fact that in, in order to place objects, there is always there is, there is something potentially subversive in this set of activities. That Absolutely. You're no longer in the in the you're no longer in the service of somewhere else. You're, someone else, you're in the service of yourself. Which I suppose if you think of it in terms of military leadership, you are, you're the person who can just come in and, and hammer the agenda. But I'm not, it feels like that, some, he very specifically picks out this thing of the, of the other side of the truth, so the truth is decorum and yeah, yeah, right. everything is right, and then you suddenly have this other the truth, this military guy who just come around. And in, for him, it, it, it's interesting that it becomes a technological thing, but in, in, in pointing to the the role of the architect as, as managing the placement of stuff, in that somewhere there is a kind of subversivity which is to do with actually disobeying the laws of nature. In order, the crane would be a kind of classic example where you do the thing that shouldn't be possible, you lift the huge stone of the wind. Right. And I'm wondering, if, uh, I think that thing almost actually feels like it comes out with later. It's our reading, it's our optimistic reading of this contribution to the but it feels like we have a need for this subversive, to find that, or to for anchor that notion of this subversive project. Absolutely. Very much in his text. But I mean, that's really what Alberti is about. Eh? Alberti, Alberti is, uh, for me, fantastic because it's both the one that uh, created this incredible, efficient uh, edifice of architecture as a, an institutional machine, but at the same time, the one that inserts uh, doubts and, 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 you know, Moments of collapse in that system. And actually, it's very a description of the Florence Cathedral in the introduction to Della Vectura. The three things that he values it for are ultimately complete um, contradictions of the Vitruvian basis yes. of what makes something appropriate in terms of decor. decor. They disobey nature, it disobeys what the experts say, and it disobeys what everyone does. And that's very interesting. I see the point in the architectural truth of the that contradictions would be in place. So maybe I'll let you the point by this case. Absolutely. Uh, this, this is part of why I'm trying to get to argue for it. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, first of all, uh, this is also part of why I always argue for Kant. Uh, and especially the of course, the critique of judgment and the still you know, the possibilities for having that with this kind of, uh, kind of a radical return to critique the possibilities and thinking about the judgment and the structure of the you know, posting of the aesthetic judgment and the possible autonomy that might rest, which is also the possibility of the absolute innocent. But also the, the fact that this is perhaps a bit bizarre, uh, but as modernity is it's it's frank. I mean and in this sense uh, you can use uh, the floor in an operative way in the sense of, of, of him, of using the, I mean, it's not, we, we cannot stop, obviously we cannot stop producing. Right. 
uh, at the same time, we have, but we cannot either stop critiques. I mean, in a sense, we, but we have to do both and, yes. not neither nor. But that's the big question. I mean, uh, what the stake here is, is it neither nor or both and? I mean, we still have to produce, we still have to, uh, even, though the, uh, even though the forces of the apparatuses uh, may, you know, may result in this, you know, this lecture being put on YouTube and so forth. I say this is an important, I think we have to do that, but at the same time we have to keep you know, critiquing that. And that's the whole the kind of dialectic that I think that yes. still has to learn us to us and you know, uh, uh, still has to help us. Yes. Yes. Instead of this kind of post critical, yes, of course. I mean, passive nihilistic stance that used to help states quo. I, mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, I don't even question that thing anymore because for me, the fact that it's totally relevant is so clear that I don't think you should even spend time to say that post-critical is just, uh, you know, not only uh, useless, but uh, not even good at what it's supposed to do, which is to be a, a, an efficient uh, uh, celebration of neoliberalism, you know. I mean, if it would be good at that, it would be already good for post-critical, you know, if it would be really good, efficient, uh, conservative, uh, I'm, I'm always for conservative positions. I think that there is always something to learn from them. Uh, but you, you cannot learn anything from that stuff, which is totally irrelevant. And I do believe, as you said, that, uh, yes, I believe in the... I mean, that's why, you know, I mentioned before Alberti, because Alberti is exactly that. And in fact, not, not by chance, Tafuri was obsessed with Alberti. And his last... Uh, one of his, the second last uh, class um, course he gave before he died was, was an Alberti. I was a student. At the time, I mean, it was in the first year, I only saw two lectures, and you know, you could see that he would almost identify himself with with Alberti. I mean, there was a really a strong uh, connection between the two projects. Do we, do I actually have, have one yeah. further question, which um, which is about where the project, where your project is. We should stop, but. It intrigued me yesterday, I mean, Pierre Vittorio gave a presentation yesterday where they showed a number of people who were Latinos projects from Dogma. Um, and in the middle of it, uh, Cedric Price's Farm Palace came up. Yeah. And I'm interested to hear your position on, on Price. Uh, that's in it because Price, in one sense, appears very far away. I think very, very close to what you're talking about, but people probably would think very far away. Well, actually, uh, I don't want to. Uh, uh, no, no, I don't want to advertise my work. But I just published a very long article on Cedric Price, uh, where, in fact, I, I mean, to make it very short, I see his projects as the most uh, uh, strong anticipation of post-Fordism, but with Cedric Price not at all understanding what he was doing. And in a way, having this kind of uh, belief in the progressive uh, dimension of his work, uh, which, which today looks as one of the most uh, incredible, interesting anticipation of post-Fordist uh, entrepreneurial uh, subjects. You know, Fan Palace was really about uh, having fun, but that at, uh, in, a, in a situation where fun becomes productive. Uh, and of course, that is a, a you know a clear uh, allegory of the. I mean, Fan Palace is the is is the is the project that really anticipated uh, the contemporary understanding of space in relationship with production. But what is tragic that Cedric Price sold that project in so naive terms uh, that uh, you know it's it's interesting but I have to say that uh, I consider him uh, one of the architects um, I really admire and um, in in the book I will you know will be a follow-up of, of this one he there is a chapter actually really on, on the work of Cedric price the project is that or where the project is, because the, the, it feels very much that the project is uh, in the archive now. I mean, Absolutely. Not, the project is not there because it's not built, I mean, the project is a, uh, a load of other stuff. He, he was an architect with absolutely a project. I mean, he was really an, uh, one of, and it's very strange also for a 
British uh, architects, because British architects are always extremely matter-of-fact, pragmatic, uh, and is one of the few who had really this strong belief uh, in a project that not necessarily has to be uh, realized. And there is a strong coherence across his, his work, uh, which is very strong. Uh, and uh, also, it's a very beautiful work. I mean, beautiful drawings, which for me is always an important criteria to fall in love with an architect. He has to draw. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, uh, for me, the progressive terms through which he presented his work are very problematic and need to be questioned today. Related to this thing of how the book ends in the 1970s yeah. and the uh, impossibility in some way to continue. All yeah. that. And what you've been saying, and we talked about that yesterday also in relation to, to uh, I see your work as a kind of critique of liberal planning in some way. Right. And, and also now when you emphasize this thing about the ruin, I mean, we stand mm -hmm. at the point of the ruin of the welfare state. And, and, and if, I, maybe that's also to oversimplify, but is it in one way the only way to move? Mm -hmm. Forward is to go back into those rooms, a little bit like Pyramids in some way. I mean, Albert, what's yeah, yeah. Roman? I mean, I think that all, uh, I mean, it's, first of all, it's, I don't think it's the only way. I hope there are other ways. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to sell my argument as the only argument. But I know uh, that very often uh, um, to look back uh, is, a, is a very uh, useful way to move forward. Uh, also because uh, history is never uh, about the past. Uh, history is always about the present because it's something that is constantly rewritten uh, in the present. And it's usually a, a fundamental way to kind of readjust our own understanding of the present. So I don't, I, for me to look back is not a kind of nostalgic uh, act, uh, but rather I see it as a, as a radical way to re-approach the present uh, without the kind of um, um, prejudice that uh, we inherit from past histories. Okay. Okay. Maybe we end here. Uh, you want to say something, Tim? Or? Yeah. Well. Thanks.